Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the fourth day of our course on Ocean Literacy, Know Your Planet Beyond the Lead. In the first three days, we completed the first part of this course, understanding the complex ocean, the concept of sustainability, and the goods and services provided by the ocean. From today, we are beginning the second part, that is governing our ocean. And to begin with, our today's session is on governing global commons. I'd like to just uh, update all the participants on this. In case if you see a syllabus, there is a slight change. We have shifted the session, which was supposed to be held on Tuesday to today. And Tuesday, today's topic will be conducted on Tuesday by Sunil Saritsal. So to have uh, start with our session, we have with us so Sunil Sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I'll also like to mention, sir, that uh, Captain Agni Hotri, sir, has also joined with us. Well, welcome, Dr. Agni Hotri. Welcome, sir. Brief for that, uh, without... Uh, yeah, good, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Agni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for your support, as always. Uh, without further ado, I'll request Sunil, sir, to commence with the session. Over to you, sir. I need the share. Yes, I'll permit you to share the screen. No, it still says disabled. Oh, so you can check now? Yeah, good. Okay. Okay, is that good? Yes, sir, visible. Good to go. Thank you. So, good afternoon again, and uh, welcome uh, for the fourth session today. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, many of you are joining here online or through YouTube, etc. And uh, as always, it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, talk to you. And uh, it'll be a greater pleasure if I'm able to have a conversation with you. Uh, I'm sorry, yesterday we ran over a little bit. So I would like um, uh, Sneha to keep a little bit of a check on me. We've got about 16 or 17 slides to go through today. So from 92 to slide number 92 to about 100 and uh, whatever, you know, 108 or something like that. Yes, so, sir. Yeah, just keep a track of if I'm, you know, taking too long on one slide or something or somewhere along halfway through, you can say, you know, that we got like whatever time left. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank I'll you. make a note. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I should actually uh, carry a watch or something, but I have stopped wearing a watch for a long time. And uh, obviously everybody has a mobile phone, but my mobile phone for, for some reason doesn't show the time on. It just switches off after some time. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, so welcome again, uh, and a particular welcome to uh, Commander, uh, sorry, Captain Agnihotri, Dr. Agnihotri, uh, and uh, we are always uh, grateful to have you in the audience, so we can also have uh, some chats on the side uh, or directly when, when my, my talk finishes. Thank you. So let me begin. So I'm going to talk about, uh, again, like I said in uh, uh, a couple of my previous lectures, that uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a, a, a glimpse of the of the whole whole scenario, as it were, uh, for the simple reason that we can only cover so much. That's number one. But most importantly, uh, I want to use this as a hook. So uh, you you understand the term hook uh, when when the when when people do fishing, fly fishing particularly, they have a hook. So the hook has got a bait, and the bait's attached to the hook. And then when you throw the hook into the 
uh, water, then the fish catches the bait and then you can catch the fish. So that's the idea generally. So my lectures hopefully serve as a, serve as a hook uh, or a bait uh, so that you can then uh, look, look, more, look for more information and uh, 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 look for uh, uh, greater, greater thoughts, ideas, knowledge, philosophies, whatever. And we can also continue the discussion, not, not just during these 10 days, but subsequently uh, over a, a period of time. So uh, that would be really great. So, now today I don't have the control thing at all. I don't know what's happening. Anyway, so let me start with the word governance itself because we're talk, talking about global governance. So let's start with the word governance. The term governance has become a buzzword, uh, as it were, uh, uh, in the development discourse particularly since the 1990s. Not that the word was not used before, but it was used in a context of governments, actually. Gov what do governments do? Governments do governance. So that was the sort of general, broad understanding of the word governance. But um, as, um, uh, as Ram, uh, my friend Ram Bouj mentioned the day before yesterday, uh, we had the, uh, the conference on environment and development in 1992, the Rio conference uh, in 1992 the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. And that's where this word governance actually came quite a lot uh, in, in, in connection with the whole idea of development. This whole, whole question of gender and development, environment and development, society and development, and so on. So these concepts came, I, I would say they came from the 1970s from the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, but they kept on getting strengthened uh, Ram Bouj also mentioned, for example, the Brundtland Report, uh, Our Common Future, or the World Commission for on uh, Environment and Development. So again, that's when that was in 1987 uh, that the the word was used, uh, World Commission on Environment and Development, which then eventually led to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So, so I, I would say 70s, but then the 80s onwards, and then the 90s in particular, and when 90s on, onwards has become a uh, a buzzword uh, in the development discourse. Now, what is meant by governance in that in that context? So, uh, public sector management, transparency, legal framework, accountability, information, as well as uh, are some of these sort of key components of gov governance. So, uh, transparency of information, transparency of what's happening in your organization, uh, uh, well set out and a well. Uh, well established, but also well publicized uh, legal framework, uh, accountability, you know, somebody has to be, you know, there, there's this famous uh, saying called the buck stops here. So somebody has to be accountable at the end of the day when something goes wrong uh, so that you can blame that person. This, the, the buck has to stop with that person. There's got to be a person at the apex or at some point in, the, in your hierarchy where that person can be given all the kudos and all the big bats. Uh, depending on how successful or how un unsuccessful uh, that organization is. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, we had something called the standards in public life. So this happened as a result of, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have uh, had recent controversy in the Indian, Indian Parliament uh, uh, where uh, uh, people were uh, accused of uh, taking kickbacks in order to ask questions in the Parliament. So UK Parliament is not 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 too dis uh, not too dissimilar. Uh, we had a similar situation in the UK Parliament uh, some decades ago, and there was a there was an MP who was accused and and convicted in a way uh, of uh, taking cash for questions. So obviously, as a result of that, uh, there was a there was a commission set up uh, by the House of Lords and two lords, Lord Neil and Lord, lord Nolan. In, well, coincidentally. The person accused also a Neil. His, his name was Neil Hamilton, uh, uh, but uh, but that's another story. But the on the on the on the on the regulation side of things, there was a Lord Neil and there was a Lord Nolan. They they sat together and they were the heads of the commission set uh, set up by the government on standards in public life, and they have decided that in public life, any individual to be in public life. Uh, so, you know, doing doing public service should fulfill those seven criteria. 
And the seven criteria are selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. Now, obviously, uh, you might say if you're having these seven criteria, you will not find any, any, any leader at all <laughs> in the world who will fulfill these criteria at all times. But the idea is that, you know, you try to fulfill this criteria uh, to the best of your ability, to the extent possible. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you're caught not fulfilling any of these, then you can be held culpable. That's the main, main point. The main point is everybody is, I mean, not, uh, not everybody is following these. Uh, but if they, they are found to be not following it, and if they are caught not following it, then they can be held cul culpable. So that's the idea behind it. You know, so it's not so, so much whether you're following these or not, but whether you, when you are not following it, then you get caught. You know, that's where the problem comes. But anyway, that, that's the ideal. So selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. And in fact, if you apply for a public position in the UK, uh, sorry, yeah, in the UK, uh, uh, like you want to become a, a, a sort of sort of a advisor somewhere or a chairman of some non-governmental organization or a government body or something like that, then you have to actually write a substantive paragraph or a, or a, or a, or a page on each one of these to say that how self how you have shown to be selfless, how you have shown to be shown your integrity, how you have shown your objectivity, how you have shown your accountability, how you have shown your openness, honesty, leadership during your career. You know, so you have to give examples of how you have exemplified those seven seven features. Anyway, so that's how I mean, ideal governance would be when those seven criteria are fulfilled. And the most important quote that I want to leave you when we talk of governance is this one by by uh, uh, Grunert and uh, and uh, Whitaker, and uh, in the in, in they have said that the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate okay and this is this is something this must this must uh, stimulate your mind you know this must this thought must stimulate your mind the whole time whether you are a leader or a follower but the the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior that the leader is able to tolerate or willing to tolerate so that's what the that's what will determine the culture of an entire organization whether it's it's a government body, whether it's a non-governmental organization, whether it's a, a, a corporate body, whether it's a business organization, whatever the organization may be, whatever the nature of the organization, the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate is going to determine or define the culture of any organization. So when we say some organization is great, you know, when we say, uh, you know, Tata's, for example, are a great industrial house in the country, you know, that's 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 what defines it basically. Okay, the worst behavior the leader is going to tolerate or willing to tolerate. I think so. That's a very important thought. I want to say, if not, if nothing else gets out of this lecture, you know, this is the one. This is the message you must take yourself um, and and try to well, of course, follow to the extent possible. So okay, we live in what we call as a VUCA world. So this is when I first went to England, or sometime before that, actually, uh, in the uh, yeah, sort of around the time uh, early eighties, kind of uh, when I uh, when I first heard this term in a management context, and it basically said that we live in a VUCA world. Okay, so VUCA world meaning we live in a world that is defined by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So if you take these four words and if you look at the ocean or the environment, okay, you will see that these there is so, so much common in these four words. And uh, so any organization, any government, any, anything is characterized by those four features. Our world is characterized by those four features. But environment and the ocean are definitely characterized by their volatility, by their uncertainty, by their complexity and by their ambiguity, we don't understand. So like I said, uh, volatility in the sense, you know, it, it is he, something happens today and something completely different happens tomorrow in terms of weather patterns or in terms of our climate change. Uncertainty, you know, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, whether there's going, there's going to be an earthquake or a tsunami or there's going to be a typhoon or a, a you know, some other calamity of some nature. Or, and it's complex. It's complex because it is biogeochemical fluxes all working together in a in a completely unforeseen manner. Okay, so biogeochemical fluxes working. That's another phrase I would like you to kind of take with you. Biogeochemical fluxes, you know, inputs and outputs because of biological, geological, 
and chemical activities that are happening all around us the whole time, including us, a part of that biogeochemical uh, activity. And ambiguity, like I said, because we know so little about the ocean. We know only we have only five or eight percent of the ocean mapped, and we know little about uh, you know. In in fact, the reason sometimes uh, the climate scientists are blamed for not giving us a, a certain figure or certain uh, information, uh, which is um, which they cannot say is hundred percent certain, because there are so many uncertainties involved in it, and they are trying to be truthful to what they are trying to tell you. you know? And that I, as a result of that, what happens is. People think that, oh, the scientists are being ambiguous. They're not being ambiguous because the situation is ambiguous. Okay. So if you want this VUCA to change, there's another VUCA, which is by having a vision, you know, a, a, a broader vision, a greater vision, you know, not, not missing the, the, the wood for the trees, as they say, you know, not missing. The, so getting the broader picture, uh, understanding instead of uncertainty, complexity, clarity in, instead of uh, complexity and agility. In, in place of ambiguity. So, you know, moving quickly. Yes, things are ambiguous, but if you can move quickly, things can be achieved. So, so that was uh, another, uh, you know, concept I want, wanted to get through here uh, in our talk regarding governance. So, one of the things that governance tries to achieve or wants to achieve or ought to achieve is conflicts and governance. How does, how does uh, uh, governance help in conflict? So, that well, the obvious thing is governance should try to resolve conflicts. Yeah, that's what it is. It, it is there for. So conflicts arise and governance is there to resolve conflicts. So uh, and conflicts are there by the nature of the organization that we have or by the nature of resources that we have and the uses that we have. So if you look at resources and uses that we talked about uh, yesterday, uh, so there is a situation that you may have one use and the other. So you can have two uses side by side, sitting side by side. So you can have shipping and navigation on the one side and ports and harbors on the other side. No problem. Yeah. You can have shipping on the one side and fishing on the one side with a little bit of difficulty. So, so you may have one use and not the other. So you can have fishing in the same area, but you can't have oil and gas drilling and fishing happening in the same area. Okay. So that's, that's a bit of a problem. Then you may have one use or the other. So you can, mutually exclusive. You can either do it this or that. You can't do both at a time. And sometimes it might be a situation where you may have one use and it is dangerous to have the other use. For example, uh, pollution and fishing in the same area. You know, you'll be con eating contaminated fish like happened in Minimata Bay in, in Japan, which led to the mercury poisoning in the 1950s and the 60s and led to the Minimata laws. Now, a Minimata convention and Minimata laws. Uh, and I don't know whether you heard of something called the, uh, uh, the, 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 the brain disease that animals used to suffer, cows used to suffer particularly. Uh, that kind of disease first started in Minimata Bay because uh, fish were eaten by men or humans, or sorry, fish were eaten by, pe uh, by people, but they were also eaten by their pets, which is cats. You know, in Japan, cats are very, you know, very popular pets. So the cats were eating it. And because of their body mass, you know, obviously the humans were affected later, but the cats were affected immediately. And they would, they would be, uh, they would show these symptoms of uh, brain damage because they could not, uh, they, they were disorientated very quickly. So those that would be what you call as a, a, a dangerous to have another use. Or for example, the other would be you cannot have uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sea surfing and scuba diving in the same area. You could be, you know, getting capitulated. You know, if your your head could be chopped off, if the sea surfer comes along, uh, comes up, bobs up and down, and you have uh, some uh, water scooter going past it at high speed. So, yeah, so those are some of the issues that you have to think about. So in terms of when you look at resources and uses, they don't tend to be uh, competitive, conflictive, uh, sorry, conflicting and complementary. So those are the three I can sort of classify in those three categories when we talk of resources and uses. So they are competitive in the sense that, you know, oil and gas will compete, for example, with fishing. And, you know, people will say, oh, which is more economically, you know, useful as a, as a, as a short term solution to things. Uh, economy and stuff like that. Or people might say uh, oil and gas might be more competitive to 
to uh, uh, coastal mining of sand and aggregate, aggregate or something, or oil and gas may be more profitable than leisure and tourism, or leisure and tourism might be more profitable than fishing and and uh, oil and gas taken together. So the competitiveness of it, and then that's how you determine the socioeconomic benefits that you are deriving from that particular activity without forgetting the environmental damage. And then conflicting is when, when resources and uses actually conflict, like, like I have given you some examples, and complementary. You know, increasingly what's happening is people go on their leisure and tourism kind of uh, holiday somewhere, and then they go to the local local fishing fishery uh, organization or fishery body, lo local fishery body, fishing body. And then they say, oh, can we come on your boat and, you know, spend the day on your fishing boat and see how fishing is, uh, how difficult or how 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 much fun how how much how how much of a difficulty and how much fun is it and also we can at the end of the day catch fresh fish and probably eat it you know so there's this synergy between uh, tourism and fishing so that, that there can be a whole lot of those kind of complementary uh, what you call um, uh, uh, resources resources and uses so the other thing is uh, so so governance what you try to achieve is it would create healthy competition, not unhealthy conflict. So that would be another purpose of uh, governance. And of course, seeking resolution of conflicts would be, as I said right at the beginning of this slide, seeking resolution of conflicts is something that the uh, governance would try to achieve. Uh, improve complementarity. So where there is no complementarity, create a compl complementarity. Where if there's some complementarity, can we make it more and more compl uh, com uh, complementary? And then finally, achieve equitability. So again, going back to the point that I was mentioning right in the beginning, I was talking about the equitability between, between society, environment, and economics, you know, or, or people, planet, and profit. You know, that equitability is something that you would want to try and achieve through governance. Right. So further boost to our interests. So obviously, we are interested in the resources. You know, I, I, I mentioned to you what the resources were and what the uses were. And the further boost to those interests came out of basically socioeconomic necessity. So in fact, uh, I, I will talk about it a little bit later, but let me mention to you, when the United Nations was formed in 1945 after the Second World War, it was not so much about the environment. In fact, there was no mention of the word environment or there was no, there was no concept in people's mind about the environment at that point in time. So it was socioeconomic needs. It was society and the and the economics. So socioeconomic necessity. Uh, Indira Gandhi had a famous famous slogan uh, in the in the seventies and eighties: uh, "Roti, kapra, and makan." Because that's our basic necessity. That's our basic need: uh, roti, kapra, and makan. Food, clothing, and shelter. Yeah, food, clothing, and shelter. Everybody needs that. It is whether you are you are a multi billionaire or whether you are a pauper. Everybody needs food, clothing, and shelter. That's our minimum basic requirement. And for that, you it, sometimes it becomes a necessity to look for resources and to exploit resources. Indira Gandhi also during the Stockholm conference, uh, at the, and I, I quoted the, uh, the, the, the ending end of the speech from, from the Rigveda that she, she talked about not, not, hurting the, uh, not hurting the heart when, when I, I take out uh, things from uh, by digging into you and stuff like that. She also paraphrased the famous quote, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And she said power pollutes and absolute, sorry, poverty pollutes and absolute poverty pollutes absolutely. That doesn't mean that affluence doesn't pollute. Affluence pollutes, pollutes equally or even more. But the affluence has got the recourse to take care of it. It's got the means to take care of it. Whereas when poverty pollutes, it does not have the resources to take care of the pollution that it is producing. That's the difference between why, why I say uh, or why uh, Indira Gandhi had made or she didn't exactly made the statement, but she, she implied that. She said poverty pollutes and absolute poverty pollutes absolutely. So the poorer you are, the, the pollution will, will happen and you have, don't, don't have the resources to take care of that pollution. Uh, a, a rich country, uh, affluent country, affluence also produces pollution, but the affluent people or affluent, affluent countries or affluent nation states will have the capability, you know, 
I mean, just give an example of affluent people. So if, if you are very wealthy, I can have my entire house air conditioned and I can have my, I can have pollen filters and I can have, uh, you know, whatever AQI filters and all those kind of things for my, for my mansion. And I'm fine, you know, because I'm rich. But the poor can't. The poor have to suffer in the heat. So, uh, and they have to breathe the uh, highly polluted air that we get everywhere. And they have to work in those circumstances. The rich people don't have to. So that's the difference. And that's what she was trying to bring out. So it is the it is poverty allevi alleviation. That's the main message that, that was going through there, through Roti Kapra Makan and all that. Anyway, political and cultural aspirations. What happened was countries started becoming independent after the Second World War. Uh, we became independent in 1947. And many other countries, many other countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America started to get independent. So they became what we, what came naturally was the post-war new nationalism and post-war new independent countries wanted to be masters of their own destiny because their, their erstwhile rulers, their erstwhile colonizers were the rulers of their destiny, were the masters of their destiny, but countries just as our own country and many other countries that became independent after the second world war for whatever reason, okay, um, they, they became independent and when they became independent, they wanted to be masters of their own destiny rather than giving their destiny in the hands of their colonial masters. So that became another uh, important reason as to why we wanted to exploit and explore and find what resources we have and what we can do with them. And then, of course, came scientific discovery and technological possibility. So knowledge, science gave us knowledge. And technology gave us the wisdom. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So knowledge came and then we found out exploitability. How much can we exploit? What is the, you know, uh, suppose there is iron, suppose there is gold uh, uh, in Tolar gold field, but how much does it, does it cost to extract the gold? Is it is it more expensive to get it out than it is worth? Uh, and sometimes even if it is more expensive than it is worth getting it out, is it still worth doing it for strategic reasons? Many times that is that is also a criteria. Sometimes you might want to, you might need to spend more than we get for strategic reasons. And then usability, what do you do with it? When you have the resource, what do you do with it? Are you able to do something with it? Or are you going to just get that resource and sell it to somebody because you cannot do anything with it? The technology, you don't have the technology. Yeah. So what do you do? You produce something in high quantity and then you, you have no technology to make use of it or refine it or make it into a finished product. So it just goes into somebody else's territory. They make the finished product, they make the profits, and you only get the money for the raw material, which is which is pittance. All those kind of things have to be thought of. And then, of course, most important thing in my mind is wide-eyed science fiction, you know, imagination, thinking big, thinking out of the, out of the box, and think crazy things, basically. You know, people might say you're mad or whatever. But that's what that's what it is. So popular and imaginative writings by people like, uh, you know, Arthur Clarke, science fiction writers, uh, and and John Merrow, whom I mentioned uh, uh, yesterday regarding uh, the manganese nodules. So these people fantastic have wrote wrote fantastic things in, in their books, in their science fiction or science reality books, whatever. And uh, Jules Verne wrote wrote about, um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, about 20,000 leagues under the sea and so on. So there was there was a lot of these sort of science fiction books and science fact books that started people to imagine things, made, made people to imagine things. But imagination is not enough. You know, Einstein himself said very important, very, very significantly, Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge at any time is limited. Imagination is unlimited. Okay. So you can you can have unlimited imagination, but then it has to be fed by something else. You cannot just have imagination and leave it at that. So it's got to be imagine, think, create. So that's the that's the step by step philosophy or process by which you can do something with your imagination. If you just imagine big things and go go back to sleep, that's not going to do anything. What is going to do things is when you imagine, then you think, oh, what can I do? And then create something, do something. And that's what will send send uh, you know humans to moon to the bottom of the sea and uh, to the other planets and etc cetera, etc cetera, whatever we do do agriculture revolution or feed feed 
millions or get rid of uh, famines and poverty and hunger and all those kind of things. Yeah. So those are that, that's where uh, you know uh, D. H. Lawrence very famously said says that dreams not when you are asleep. Sorry, not D. H. Lawrence, but T. E. Lawrence. T. E. Lawrence being Lawrence of Arabia, the one who wrote. Uh, uh, seven pillars of wisdom, in fact, from whom I have borrowed my own lecture circuit, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So dreams, not when you are asleep, but dreams that won't let you sleep. Uh, Abdul Kalam, our president, had a similar quote. He sort of re rehashed the quote from, from uh, T.E. Lawrence and used a similar quote. So the quote is really that dreams, not when you are asleep, but dreams that won't let you sleep. And that's what you want to uh, do so the imagination has got to be that 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 is going to lead to something not just just imagine great things and you know or just imagine imagine crazy things and um, go back to bed no so and then of course in the 60s we were hit by pragmatism already in the 60s mind you 1972 was only was still about 10 years away when rachel carson wrote a famous book called silent spring and in that book she talked about what are we doing to the environment Talk, talk, talking about 1963, if I'm not mistaken, that's when she wrote that book. And this was because it, it was called Silent Spring because there was a lot of pesticides that were used in uh, particularly DDT that was used in California uh, and some parts of the US where uh, as a pesticide on agricultural farms. And this was all ending up in the sea. That This was being eaten by fish. The contaminated uh, things were eaten by fish which were then eventually eaten by the birds. And when the birds ate these DDT infested fish, what happened was when they, when they laid their eggs, the DDT caused the eggs shell to thin. So you know that the mother bird would sit on the um, uh, eggs to hatch the eggs. But when the bird sat on the eggs, it actually cracked because the shells were not strong enough to hold the weight of the mother because the shells had been thinned by the, uh, by this, uh, DDT infestation. So it was a disaster scenario where there were colonies of these birds and none of the birds, new birds were born. So there was no chirping in the spring. You know, the chirping of the birds that you hear in the spring, that was not heard because all the eggs were crushed under the weight of the mother birds. And that was, that's why she called the book The Silent Spring. And this became, as you, if you say, this became as if it was a Bible of the environmental movement. Okay. So, so this brings me to my own personal story. And this story is between uh, February and December of 2002. Uh, I was already working in the area of ocean governance, but I didn't call it ocean governance. I would call it, call it ocean policy, or ocean law, or environmental law, and stuff like that. And uh, in February of uh, 2002, on the 7th of uh, February, my mentor, Elizabeth Van Borghese, who founded the International Ocean Institute back in 1972, she died. And then 10 days later, my father died. Uh, uh, so in, in two uh, sort of in a matter of, of less than a fortnight, uh, I lost the two most important people that influenced me apart from my mother. So I was thinking throughout that time from from February until the end of that year, how can I pay a tribute to both these people? Because my father was a very good speaker. And uh, my, my mentor, of course, the, uh, had given me the philosophy since 1982. Uh, so for 20 years, I had been under her tutelage. So I thought, how do I combine these two together? Uh, together uh, my father's oratory and my, my, my mentor's philosophy. And that's when I came out with this idea of seven pillars of ocean governance. You know, and seven, I borrowed the title seven pillars from... Uh, you know, Seven Pillars of Wisdom by uh, T.E. Lawrence, as I mentioned a bit uh, a little while ago. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, as, as, uh, as, as uh, many people would tell you, if you have not read the book yourself, it is an immensely unreadable book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Uh, I mean, most people, including me, have it on my bookshelf, uh, but uh, I haven't uh, managed to read it uh, in one sitting from end to end. Uh, it's like, uh, it's somewhat like The Brief History of Time by by Stephen Hawkins. Again, uh, a very difficult book to read uh, in one go, uh, end to end. But yeah, but these these are what you call seminal books. So he, that title I borrowed and called it The Seven Pillars of Ocean Governance and started my lecture circuit. Uh, and I, I call that advice, advice in the sense I would give this advice to whoever, whoever will listen to me. Uh, I 
I jokingly say that I I would even give it to anybody who doesn't listen to me as long as they pay me. But that's a different story. So anyway, so advice in terms of the seven pillars and the seven pillars are listed as you can see here. Science and technology is the first one. And science and technology always I I mentioned to you earlier a little bit earlier that it's about knowledge and wisdom. Science is like knowledge. Technology is wisdom. You know you know something. What do you do with it? I I know nuclear science. Yeah, so that's knowledge. But what do I do with nuclear science? Do I do nuclear medicine? Do I produce nuclear energy or produce a nuclear bomb? Yeah, that's my choice, and that's wisdom. So wisdom or lack of wisdom, whatever you like to call it, it's a double-edged sword. Science and technology is a double-edged sword because the same science and technology is the one that created the problems that we are facing today. But science and technology also will solve the problems that science and technology has created. Yeah. It is. It is. It is only science and technology which will be your savior. Although we might think it's oh, it's the science and technology that has created a lot of problems that we know of today. Uh, I always give the example of um, um, a, a, a famous inventor whose name uh, it will come back to me. Um, and he he was the first one to put uh, lead in petrol and uh, uh, use um, ammonia. Uh, sorry, as uh, use CFC as a refrigerant. Yeah. John Midgley Jr. He was called John Midgley Jr. One of the great, a very a great sort of inventor. Uh, he had great patents under his name, etc. But if you see his Wikipedia page now, so when he was, when he was, when when when, when I was a student in the 70s, uh, his his picture used to be there in heating and refrigeration engineering, thermodynamics, and those kind of books. You know, uh, internal combustion engines and that kind of that kind of stuff. Because he was a great inventor. But then, if you see his uh, Wikipedia page now, he's dead. If you see his Wikipedia page, he he was a great scientist. He won the American Chemical Society prize and this and that, many many prizes, highly decorated scientist. But at the end of the day, you read his Wikipedia page, and one line says it all. He says it says that he has uh, contributed to the destruction of the environment uh, single-handedly more than any single any organism in the world. You know, because of two of his major inventions, there were many others. One was putting lead in petrol, and the other was using CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, as uh, as uh, refrigerants. Anyway, so it's a double-edged sword. Geopolitical economy. That's the second one, second pillar. Where is where is where is stuff produced? Where is stuff produced, and where is it consumed? How is it produced? Is it produced as raw material? Is it made into a finished product, or is it sent as a raw material somewhere else, and somebody else makes finished product out of it? Where is farm products coming from? Where is your fish coming from? Where is your food coming from? How many food miles has it traveled? How many carbon miles has it traveled? What is the car carbon footprint of all the stuff that is happening, that is produced and consumed? And the most important thing that you have to guard about, guard against in uh, geopolitical economy is the idea of privatization of profits and socialization of costs. You know, when I have a, if I if I have a herd of a thousand animals, thousand cows, and I'm milking them and selling milk, I won't talk about meat cows, but I'm, I'll only talk about milch cows. So I'm getting milk and I'm getting milk products and I'm making a lot of money out of my thousand cows. Suddenly, foot and mouth disease hits the cows. Suddenly, some uh, you know some disease hits the cows, they die. And then I may, when when I make the profit. I, I, I keep the profit to myself. I buy more, more cows and increase my herd. But as soon as the cows start dying, I go to the government and say, bail me out. Yeah, This happened in, in the banks in 2008, if you remember. Globally, it happened. Yeah, When the banks were making profits, they didn't go to the government saying, oh, we're making lots of profit. Here's more, more tax. We'll pay more taxes. They, they never did. Then they managed their taxes and paid less taxes, in, in fact. Right? So the same thing. So privatization of profits. When profits are there, it's all mine. When I start making loss, I pass it on to you. So that's, that has got to be avoided. Institutions and organizations, third pillar. What sort of institutions do we want? Democratic organizations. We want democratic organizations to the extent possible. We want consensus. We don't want, actually, we don't want this idea of uh, voting even. We want consensus. In fact, the European Union has a speciality that it works mostly on consensus. Everybody agreeing to something. Sometimes some people say that, oh, that might re reduce things to what we call as the least common denominator. But that's not always true. If you are able to convince how good the proposals are, most people will agree to that. And that's how you can move forward with consensus. But if not consensus, at, le at least vote. 
not veto as it as it happens often in the Security Council in the United Nations. You know, uh, there is a there is a sensible proposal made by all the countries, and one country will come and veto the pro proposal. So that should never happen in an uh, institution, in an organization. Legislation and implementation. The key rule of lawmaking is don't legislate what you can't implement. That is a golden rule. Okay. And how how to legislate in environment in the in the area of environment and the area of ocean? Very important because because these are not owned by somebody. The global commons as we that's why we're talking about you know governance of global commons. So they they're not owned by anybody. They're owned by everybody and they're owned by nobody. So that's where the whole issue of legislation and implementation is even more critical when it comes to our ocean and our environment. Role of civil society. People talk of what is civil society. You we are social. You and I, we are all part of civil society. Civil society is not just the government or the big, big uh, corporate bodies or businesses or uh, banks or uh, you know agricultural organization and stuff like that. Civil society is all of us. <clears throat> so we say that you know government should do this, government should do that. You know my my local government should do. But what are you doing? What are you doing as an individual? As a as a group of people, as a group of enlightened people, educated people, what are we doing? What are we contributing? Mostly nothing, and that's what that's got that's got to be uh, also that's also got to change. CSR, we talk of you know corporate social responsibility. That's all very good, but what about individual social social responsibility? Do we do we take care of what's happening right outside our front gate or right right outside our fence? You know, do we look at, look after what's happening there? Do do you look out, look after the the the, the 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 litter that is thrown there and do we do anything about it yeah we don't we just ignore it and you know walk past so those are some of the things we have to think about financial initiatives money makes the world go round there's there's no there's no disputing it whatever if you want to do good things i always say uh, I, i've said it some sometime later perhaps do the right thing because it's the right thing to do probably in the next slide but to do the right things you need money you cannot do stuff without money so in fact uh, a very wise friend of mine used to always say that corporations do stuff to make money. You know, large corporations, industrial houses, they make stuff and they make money. Environmentalists, educationists like me, like us, we want to be, we need money to do stuff. So it is important. So it, it, you cannot uh, think that money is not important. Money is extremely important if you want to do good things, to get money, to do what you want to do, do the right thing. And finally, of course, the seventh pillar, Education awareness. So it's formal education that you get in schools and colleges, all very good. But informal training, informal education is also extremely important. Continuing professional development. So you cannot say I've got my degree from X, Y, Z place, a prestigious degree and all that, and I'm done for my life and I'm going to go on forever. No, you have to retrain yourself every so often. You have to learn new things because the world is changing. You know, you have to retrain yourself. You have to relearn, re-educate yourself and find a new, uh, you know, uh, new uh, way of functioning, lifelong learning. So what we are doing now is probably part of that continuing professional development or what we call as lifelong learning. Uh, it's very important to know that we must learn. We must continue to learn. We must because the day we stop learning is the day we die. Uh, you know, so that that's that's very important uh, from that point of view. And then further opportunities. What are the opportunities? Uh, that uh, uh, my my own thinking, my own thinking. One is advocacy. Talk about what influences you, or what 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 ideas and uh, well, I put ideas and ideas. So uh, I sorry, that's that's correct. So I, my own ideas. So talk about your own ideas. What are your good ideas that you want to tell people about? More importantly, talk about ideas that influence you. You know, other people's ideas that influence you. Uh, I, I am quite fascinated by this concept of universal basic income because that will change the way people live. Because there are a lot of people who, for one reason or the other, they are disabled, they are uh, you know uh, they they are old, they are infirm, whatever that might be. They are not able to contribute to the society to the extent uh, uh, that is possible. But if every everybody gets a living wage, if everybody gets a living income, then they can start thinking in terms of something else, you know, something bigger. And you never know from 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 some village, some some poor people who who have who are worried about their day to day food, where it is going to come from. If they get this universal basic income, then they can start thinking big. They can 
think in terms of, oh, can I go to college and study something? Can I learn some things? Can I learn a new skill? Because they don't have time otherwise. They are just spending their entire day eking out a very meager existence for, for a pittance. And then I mentioned to you about law, lawless to lawful, you know, land, air, and water, how our land, air, and water, uh, land is sort of uh, becoming unproductive because of uh, issues of nitrogen uh, disruption, nitrogen cycle disruption. Our air is unbreathable uh, because, uh, I mean, I was just uh, reading that 83 uh, out of the top 100 polluted cities in the world are in India. 83 out of the top 100 polluted places in the world are all in India. So air is unbreathable, water is not drinkable, and water is in short supply, extremely short supply. My, 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 some of my relatives live in, uh, in places like Latur, and there they get water supply, the municipal water supply, once in two weeks. Once in two weeks, imagine. So that's, uh, uh, that's an important consideration. Uh, and then do something that you can do, whatever little you can do in terms of little bit you can give, doesn't have to be cash always. You know, giving, your, giving away your time, volunteering, volunteering for something, doing something for the society. Water and sanitation is a huge issue, issue in India. And if you can give some time, some money, some volunteering, some ideas, some, some of your expertise for free, all of that counts in action. And of course, the aim has got to be uh, our whole thinking must change. That's the, the strap line on my website. Uh, that, and the change has got to come from within. It's got to come from inside you, not somebody forcing you to do it. And again, each one of us has got to be an agent of change and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So those are some of my thoughts which I developed during those sort of eight-month period. And then uh, as a result of that, uh, come January 2003, uh, I started my full-fledged new career, as it were, uh, as a... Uh, as a uh, sort of what you call as a consultant, educator, and speaker. So we come to ocean governance now. Uh, and uh, the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea came in 1982. I'm not going in a particular uh, chronological order here, but uh, I'm going by way of kind of the most important things. And in fact, the last one should be somewhere in the middle, but uh, I've just added it. So we'll leave it at that now. But the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, according to me, is the the best thing that that happened to the the ocean or the marine environment uh, and it was uh, it, it was enacted in 1982 uh, then you have the un framework on climate change which happened 10 years later at the rio conference the rio conference the united nations conference on environment and development uh, so this also is sometimes known as the framework convention on climate change and we have uh, the cops the conference of parties taking place Every so often, the most recent one was uh, was in Dubai, uh, at which uh, 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 Dr. Apte had gone, Vinita Apte had gone. Uh, so she might be able to say one or two things about it uh, uh, when when we have time to uh, one or two minutes in between some some time. Um, the International Maritime Organization that I mentioned to you last uh, last time, established in 1948, came into existence in 1958, and I mentioned the two universities that it runs, the IMOs. Uh, World Maritime University and the IMO's uh, International Maritime Law Institute, which I both, which I mentioned both uh, yesterday. Uh, Commonwealth Secretariat was formed in 1931. That being the our colonial masters, the Britain, uh, which used to rule. Well, they 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 said that sun didn't set in the in the British Empire. Uh, so it was as vast as that, uh, right from east to west, all over the world. So Commonwealth Secretariat was established in 1931, still exists, uh, has, I think, 56 members now, uh, recently expanded by about four or something like that. Um, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation in 1985. Uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat has got an ocean governance uh, department, a, a whole, whole sort of unit on ocean governance. Uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, uh, which is our, in, in our region. Uh, then Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, uh, which, uh, uh, which, which, is the, which is famously the, the Sagar vision that uh, the Prime Minister uh, talked about some years ago, uh, security and growth for all in the region. So that's where the Indian Ocean Rim Association comes into picture. Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, BIMSTEC as it is called, in short. And 
uh, Antarctica Treaty, of course, uh, I'll talk about Antarctica Treaty on uh, on Tuesday uh, uh, a little bit. I'll mention it. Uh, 1959, which is basically uh, uh, talks about how Antarctica should be governed uh, because Antarctica doesn't actually belong to anybody. Although states have tried to make claim on Antarctica, but it doesn't belong to anybody. And then uh, Arctic Council, again, the other side of the world, was established in 1996. Uh, India is a is a member of both these systems, both Antarctica Treaty System and the Arctic Council. In Arctic Council, we have, we have observer status. Um, Antarctica, of course, we have a uh, we have a permanent base there. Um, and then, of course, uh, I mentioned to you this latest BBNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, or the High Seas Treaty. High Seas Treaty, Tree Treaty. Okay, so I I got a thing there. Okay, so. So that was in that was last year. That was early last year. So these are some of the big uh, bodies around the world that uh, look into ocean and ocean governance related uh, things. So let me go into the history of ocean governance and history of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the territorial sea uh, is a is a concept that has been there for as long as. Uh, humanity has been civilized as it were. So as, for as long as we have had kings and queens and rulers, we have had this concept of territorial sea because we have had the concept of territory because if you are a king or queen, uh, of a, uh, then you are a king or queen of some place. And then uh, if there's a sea next to it, then how much of that sea do you uh, want to apportion to your own kingdom, to attach to your kingdom as it were? So territorial sea, um, the idea behind territorial sea in history uh, or in ancient history, as it were, was it was a concept that kings and queens were lord and master. King, kings and queens were actually uh, seen as the, the, the god's incarnation, as it were. They were, the, they were the incarnation of God on the earth. Uh, in fact, uh, some of you might be amused to her, uh, know that uh, Prince Philip, who was the, who was the husband of uh, the Queen Elizabeth II, uh, was considered to be God uh, by the, the uh, people of an island uh, in the Pacific. So, uh, so kings and queens were treated, were considered as demigods, or they were actual gods who, who came came on the earth to rule rule on us, sort of uh, uh, mere mortals, as it were. Anyway, so kings and queens were the lords and masters of all they surveyed. So that's that's how kings and queens were defined defined sovereigns. They were defined as uh, lords and masters of all they surveyed. So obviously, if a king or queen stood at a vantage point on the coast and looked out into the sea. However far they could see would be their territorial sea. That was the definition. Now, obviously, uh, we Earth used to be flat, if you remember, in the Western world, because it was Copernicus who said that Earth was round. So until that point in time, uh, there was no concept of this. But later on, when this concept came, they said, OK, if you if you look from the vantage point and look out into the sea, then because of the curvature of this Earth, then the sea will disappear or the horizon will sort of disappear because of the curvature of the earth. So that was roughly calculated to be about three nautical miles. So that became the first definition of territorial sea. But then, obviously, if you say that, oh, this, this three miles belong to me, you have got to have a way of protecting that three nautical miles. So then came the cannonball ball rule. But obviously, I cannot believe that a cannonball went three miles uh, three nautical miles that too uh, in in those days, but then that became one of the rules uh, that if you can protect your coast with a cannonball, then the cannonball rule will hold, and that would what be the territorial sea. So there were a variety of claims. Three miles was a standard claim for many for many countries, and of course there were many fewer countries then than now. There are something like 194 or 96 countries, the, depending on how you count them uh, uh, in the world. But in those days there were fewer countries. So there were a variety of claims. So there were about 20 states. I'm talking about in the early 50s, 60s, like that, you know, at that point, point in time. Uh, so after the United Nations was formed, as it were. So a variety of claims, 20 states had three miles, 12 states had six miles, and there was a Scandinavian League for four miles. And then there were, uh, there were the Latin American states who used to have patrimonial sea, they used to call it sea belonging to their fathers, you know, patrimonial sea, like matrimonial, patrimonial. Patrimonial Sea, and that was 200 nautical miles. So that was their claim. So there were a very variety of claims of these, what you call as territorial sea. And but the most important thing to remember is that the that the three mile 
territorial sea was accepted by the biggest maritime states. So if you see the biggest maritime states in the recent history, well, recent means four, 500 years ago, uh, starting from around 1492 or something like that, uh, Spain and Portugal were the two biggest maritime powers first, then followed by, of course, um, uh, many other countries and then eventually by Britain. Uh, Netherlands was there in between, France was there in between and so on. And then, of course, came Britain. And then, of course, since, uh, uh, since um, uh, I think it's the, uh, it's the 13th of February 19, 19, 1898 that the United States became the number one maritime country in the world. There's an exact date to, the, date to that, uh, which, uh, uh, which alludes to the fact that uh, it's the U.S.'s main e event, uh, which uh, started the war between uh, United States and Spain, which was, a, which was a superpower at that time, and how they pushed them back to the Philippines. So the Treaty of uh, uh, Zaragoza uh, and the, the Treaty of... Uh, uh, the, those there were two treaties which determined the, uh, the division of the world into uh, the Spanish dominion and the Portuguese dominion. Anyway, so all that. So basically, uh, then came the whole idea that if if that was defined as a territorial sea, what would be the rest of the sea called? So the rest of the sea was called high seas. And we were only talking about the surface of the sea for the most part. So it was the water bit that we were concerned about. We're not so much bothered about what was there, because as, as I told you, until and if, if in, in fact, even if you saw the maps of the world, the, maybe 50, 60 years ago, most of them used to have the land masses with all the details and everything. And the water was only just colored a pale blue, you know, a pale blue. That was that was the just color throughout. All the ocean was only painted a pale blue. And the land mass had all the, you know, in. Uh, mountains and rivers and everything showing in it. So anyway, so then high seas was basically the rest of it. Rest, everything was the high seas. And then there were freedoms of the high seas. Uh, and the freedoms of the high seas were freedom of navigation. So anybody, anybody could uh, take their ships and go out into the high sea if they can, if they could. Navigation, uh, over flight, of course, flights came much later. Laying pipelines and cables, conducting marine scientific research artificial islands, fishing, etc. So all those were what you call as freedom of the high seas. And curtailed after the United Nations Convention on the High Seas was piracy. Piracy is considered to be one of the oldest professions after fishing and shipping, or shipping and fishing, whichever we like, like to look at it. Unauthorized broadcasting, slave trade, drugs and narcotics, ships of uncertain nationality, hot pursuit, pollution, exceptional measures, and rights under treaties. So, so these all were, were curtailed since the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And we'll talk about them when we talk about the Law of the Sea on, on the 26th. What Buckminster Fuller, who is a very famous architect, and he also built the geo geodesic dome, which is, this, which is considered to be the strongest and the lightest structure that can be constructed by using pentagons and hexagons. You know, it's like a football. If you see the old football, they used to be made of pentagons and hex hexagons. Uh, now the New FIFA football is different. It's made of T's, you know, different sort of T's. But uh, the old football is to be pentagons and hexagons because that's the lightest and the strongest structure you can make using any material. So he said very famously, also, of course, the, the same shape, the same uh, configuration is uh, there for uh, a certain uh, type of a carbon molecule, uh, which is called Buckminster Minster Fullerene. That, that carbon molecule is named after him. So anyway... So Buckminster Fuller very famously said that territorial sovereignty over three miles coupled with freedom of the high seas, because there was a freedom of the high seas, that means the sea powers, the, the people who had the navies or the ships, and they had the roving uh, ambassadorship, as it were, to go anywhere and do what they wanted. So territorial sovereignty over three miles sea coupled over freedom of the high seas were the twin pillars upon which European colonial powers built their empires, starting from... Spain and Portugal, like I told you, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, this is how the world was. The world was basically uh, the powerful countries, the countries with their powerful navies, starting with Spain and Portugal, they could uh, go and uh, have, a, have a rampage, as it were, anywhere in, on the seas, and then go to the other coast, other country, and 
bomb them into submission or you know get get their soldiers on, onto onto the coast and then fight them into submission and that's how the colonial powers build their empires so the treaty of tordesillas and the treaty of zaragoza these two treaties split the world actually between the spanish domain and the portuguese domain at one point in time you know those are the two major countries and then of course later on came uh, the dutch east india company and the british east india company and then the other countries such as belgium and france and etc they all started having their own little colonization eventually uh, united states becoming the superpower if i'm not mistaken in 1898 uh, then how was the united nations convention on the law of the sea sort of how it how did it come about how did the whole idea of it come about so first of all it was a league of nations uh, before the uh, sorry this is after the second first world war sorry after the first world war league of nations was in, uh, uh, established without it was at the at the instance of the united states but without the united states so united states was not a party to the league of nations and that was created um, and then in 1924, the League of Nations created for the first time a committee of experts on the ocean. Yeah. So there was actually a committee of experts on the ocean created in 1924 by the League of Nations. And there actually a conference was held, held in The Hague, the, the capital of the Netherlands, in The Hague in 1930 to discuss the affairs of the ocean. So this, this is preliminary conference that was held. Then the United Nations came in 1945 after the Second World War. And the first thing that one of the first things that the United Nations did was to establish what is known as the International Law Commission. So the International Law Commission in 1948 was charged with the progressive development and codification of international law. OK, so not just law of the sea or international environmental law, but international public international law in general. So public international law, law would include humanitarian law, human rights law, criminal law, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, trade law, and so on. So all of those uh, uh, development and codification. Development, uh, development means creating the law, and codification means writing it down in, in a form of some kind of a written document. Okay. So that's what started in 1945, sorry, 1948, with the help of the International Law Commission, which is still a very uh, prestigious and a very uh, active body. Uh, in fact, headed uh, currently headed by two women, one of whom is a very close friend of mine from Turkey, Nilufar Oral. So they, they currently head the, the, the two of them currently head, uh, head the International Law Commission. Uh, then came the first United Nations Conference on Law of the Sea. So it's called United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea 1, Mark 1, but sometimes also known as the Geneva Conventions, in plural, Geneva Conventions. Uh, and it was held in Geneva, so Geneva Conventions. Uh, and they came out with these four conventions, Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone. So Territorial Sea, as we know, we, was always there. So we had two uh, sort of bifurcations or two demarcations within the sea, within the ocean. One was the Territorial Sea, one was the High Sea. So those two were there. But now this one created a second a third, rather, a third uh, zone, as it were, and that was called a contiguous zone. Contiguous zone was uh, defined as some kind of a buffer zone between the territorial sea and the high sea. So because territorial sea finished at three nautical miles, so we had to have something beyond that. And as a result of that, the contiguous zone came around. So that was in 1958. Around this time, the move to have but 12 nautical miles as territorial sea started to gain some uh, anchorage in the thoughts of the policy makers, including the International Law Commission. So there was a consensus, slowly, a slow consensus developing towards a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. But it had not happened. It was still generally accepted as three nautical miles. And the contiguous zone was a buffer zone of un unspecified breadth, as it were. And then, of course, there was a treaty on high seas. 
So the rest of the high seas where we talked about the freedoms of the high sea, et cetera. There was also a third convention, which was called the fishing and conservation of the living resources of the high seas. Now, this is in 1958. This is before the Stockholm conference. This is before uh, Rachel Carson's book. This is almost around the time when Minamata disease came in Japan. So you talk about 1958, quite early on. 1959 was the Antarctica Treaty, which is also quite pioneering in that sense. It came that early. But this is in 1958. And the word conservation was used for the first time in any title of any convention hitherto in 1958. So fishing and conservation. So this idea of conservation of fishing resources, that fishing resources need to be conserved because the concept in the old days what fish could be taken ad infinitum. You could take as much fish as you wanted today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and so on. Okay. So in fact, the father of law of the sea, well, the modern, Father of modern law of the sea is Arvid Pardo, but the father of the law of the sea was Hugo Grotius, Hugo de Groot, a, a, a Dutch lawyer, a Dutch, uh, uh, yeah, Dutch jurist. And he himself has written in his book, in his treatise, that fish can be taken ad infinitum. You can take as much fish as you like. And that was in, in the 17th century. And in the 19th century, none less than the president of the Royal Society. T.H. Huxley, he also himself said that fish are inexhaustible. Fisheries are inexhaustible. Although, of course, he said that in 1883 and he was challenged by his friend, Lancaster. I forget his name, first name, I think Edwin Lancaster. And he challenged him. And the very next year, he admitted that he had made a mistake because he brought him, he, he brought to his notice some data regarding, uh, you know, Fish fisheries exploitation. And he said, if you exploit too much fish, then the fish also can be extinct. Fish also can become overexploited. So in 1984, he accepted his mistake. Great man to accept a mistake, make a mistake and accept it. So anyway, so the idea of conservation came in 1958. You know, the first time the word was actually used in the title of a convention. And then, of course, the fourth convention, which introduced a new zone again, which you will see subsequently in my uh, lecture on Tuesday, uh, as another zone for uh, the mari another maritime zone. So we're talking now already from two maritime zones of territorial sea and high seas. We already got territorial sea, contiguous zone, continental shelf, and high seas. So we got four maritime zones, as it were. And then, of course, in, uh, as, I, as I was telling you, that uh, the momentum towards a 12 nautical miles was gaining. So, and they could not decide that in the 1958 uh, Geneva Conventions. So, in 1960, two years later, they held another con convention, another another conference, mainly to determine the breadth of the territorial sea. Yeah, mainly to determine the breadth of the territorial sea. So, how how broad, how, which, whether should it be three miles, six miles, nine miles, 12 miles, 20 miles, or 200 miles. So just to determine that. So single agenda meeting, single agenda conference, but it failed to get the 60 votes. It, it fell short by one vote. So nothing, no, nothing was determined. So it still remained a vague figure. Okay. Ambiguity, going back to my point about ambiguity, the hookah world, you know, so ambiguity continued. So United Nations um, uh, conference on Law of the Sea, developments in 1958 and 1960. So I've just uh, repeated that slide as it were. Uh, there was a, they, they, they wanted to have a compromise actually in the 1960 conference uh, of six miles territorial sea plus six miles fisheries zone. You know, then it was not, uh, instead of calling it contiguous zone, they called it fisheries zone. So some countries still have this fisheries zone. UK used to have it until recently. A fisher, in, in, inland fisheries, they used to call it. So anyway, so even the compromise of six miles territorial sea plus six miles fisheries zone was not accepted by 60 countries, fell short by one vote. So we move on from there. And then came the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, number three, the preparations for it. So in 1967, 
uh, ad hoc committee or what was called as the uh, the seabed committee was established for the first time at the behest of again the international law commission the international law commission suggested that there should be a seabed committee to discuss the affairs of the ocean at international level and create a constitution for the ocean of some some sort then there was another uh, uh, proposal in 1968 to create a committee on the peaceful uses of the seabed and ocean floor beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. So, but again, remember that national jurisdiction at that time point in time was vague, but it was in principle there was a territorial sea. That's it, and a, and possibly a contiguous zone, but not, no 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 defined number given to it. So ocean floor beyond the national jurisdiction, and there was also the concept of continental shelf. So a little bit of that idea was also coming in. So continental shelf is the ocean floor actually near near the coast, but all the same. And then in 1970, uh, there was the concept of common heritage of mankind that was introduced by Arvid Pardo. And he said that the sea floor, the sub 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 sea, uh, sorry, the sea floor and the seabed beneath the seafloor and the resources of the seabed were the common heritage of mankind. This was a famous, famous speech uh, given by Arvid Pardo on the 1st of November of 1967. And that's what which led to these developments. And then uh, the first session of the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea was held number three, Mark three now, was held in New York in 1973. And they concluded nine years later, you know, nine years later, in 1982, and the final act was signed in Montego Bay in Jamaica. So that's how the law of the sea came in 1982, 10 years after the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So this was the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, also acronymed as the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea once it became the convention. So for nine years, it was the conference. Once it became the convention, then it became the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, three. But now nobody calls it as United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, three. It's just simply called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The first one is called the Geneva Conventions. The second is forgotten, basically, you know. So this is the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Arvid Pardo's speech in, on 1st of November 1967. He chose that day uh, and he mentions that in his talk. It, it was the All Saints Day, you know, as the Western world has, All Saints Day. And that's, that's when he sp spoke on. And then uh, that ad hoc committee, which I mentioned earlier, was established. Uh, common heritage principle. Uh, began in uh, New York in December 1973, concluded in Montego Bay in Jamaica again in December 1982. It has got 17 parts, consists of 17 parts, 320 articles, 320 articles, nine annexes covering all aspects of the ocean space. So this is a very forward looking convention. It is in 1982, uh, it was concluded. But it is still relevant today. And of course, things, modifications have happened. The Stradling Stocks Convention came in 95. The High Seas Treaty came in 2023. And interpretations and modifications keep, keep going on the whole time. But it is still as relevant today as it was then, except that the, 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 the whole idea that Arvid Pardo has had in his mind of this whole common heritage of mankind, that common heritage of mankind principle has somewhat shrunk, as it were, as you would expect, because obviously interest groups, the richer countries, the more powerful countries will always have their say one way or the other. But it was, it was hailed as a veritable constitution for the ocean by Tommy T.B. Coe, 
uh, who was the who was the president of the conference when the con when the conclusion was done in Jamaica in 1982. Again, a, a, a very renowned uh, uh, jurist from Singapore, uh, and uh, I'm fortunate that I know him personally quite well, and we have interacted quite a lot. And coincidentally, the High Seas Treaty was also chaired, or the president of the High Seas Conference was also a Singaporean, a lady whose name I, I forget. And uh, so it, it, it's just coincidental that two uh, of the uh, top people heading the conference at that at, at, in their particular times in 1982 and 2023 were both from a tiny country, Singapore, and both uh, uh, are very eminent jurists in their area. Uh, Arvid Pardo, of course, came from another small Mediterranean country, uh, Malta, which is where Elizabeth Manborghese established the International Ocean Institute and Cosmin Q, who spoke to us on the first day uh, in place of uh, Antonella Vasallo. Uh, they are based there because the headquarters of the International Ocean Institute established by Elizabeth Manborghese uh, uh, is in Malta. So again, uh, sometimes, you know, some uh, unsuspecting or, you know, uh, unexpected uh, countries or entities or people or individuals, they can create history, as it were. Uh, and it was also termed as a revolution in the ocean by, by Tom, Tommy T. V. Cole. What I can say, a veritable Samudra Manthan or Sagar Manthan, going back to our own uh, Indian philosophy or Indian mythology, as it were. So then, Unclause 3 or the Law of the Sea Convention, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, what are the different uh, bodies that is, it is established? So first of all, it established what is known as the Preparatory Commission in New York. So obviously, because the treaty was concluded in 1982, December, uh, but they had to do many things. So, so until the uh, the treaty was ratified. Now, the idea of ratification is that uh, the, the, the individual countries have to make it part of their own law. So, for example, India will go and sign the convention, which, which they did in 1982. And then sometime later, they will discuss that in their parliament, in their lower house, in the upper house, back in the lower house, back in the upper house, whatever it goes in through iterations and then they will say okay this this treaty has been accepted as, as law in india then that will get the presidential assent similar process in britain as well similar process in many many other countries so that is called ratification so once this is done and once that instrument of ratification that means the president or the queen or the head of state or whatever uh, not head of government but it's got to be head of state so head of state has got to give, give their assent to it once they give the assent to it, then it is that that instrument, that means that document having the signature saying that this now this treaty is now part of our national law, then that is taken to the United Nations once and submitted to the United Nations. That's called a ratification. And it needed nine, it needed 60 such ratifications. So it took from 1982 until 1994 to get the 60 ratifications. So that's why during that period, the 16 years almost, there was what is called as the Preparatory Commission, which was based in, the, in New York, which then was wound up once the treaty was ratified. Then it also established the Commission on the Limits of Continental Shelf, CLCS, as it is called. I mentioned to you that you can claim and get an extra bit of your seabed beyond the you know, EZ in case you can show that show a presence of sedimentary rock beyond 200 nautical miles and of a certain thickness. There are there, there, there is a complicated and a uh, well specified procedure for it and a definition for it. Um, but once you can show that, then you can get up to 350 nautical miles of the seabed as your extended continental shelf. And which is what I mentioned that India has got another I think 800 or 900 square kilometers of extended continental shelf as a result of their claims. So 
So this was the body that, that would determine that, and it's called the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. So you submit your application for your, of your claim, and then the legal and the technical committee there will decide whether your claim is valid. If your claim is valid, they will give you that, uh, they will grant you that uh, ex extra uh, extended continental shelf. Uh, you can argue back and forth and so on and so forth. Then the International Seabed Authority uh, was established uh, in uh, Kingston in Jamaica in 1994. And uh, they basically look after this area beyond national jurisdiction from the point of view of the mineral resources. Now, obviously, the High Seas Treaty has come in 2023, which is about the biological diversity beyond biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. This is this was mineral resources specifically. So there are people like me and uh, many like-minded people who would like the International Seabed Authority to kind of oversee this side as well, because it will automatically put checks and balances because mining on the one hand is environmentally unfriendly activity, ocean mining, whereas preservation and protection of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction will be an environmentally friendly activity. So if these two activities are overseen by one and the same body, then there might be a greater amount of checks and balances within that body and things might be better, but obviously this is this is far far to go yet. Um, then the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So disputes arising out of any of the provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, they are handled by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. You can also take them to the International Court of Justice, but International Court of Justice only handles cases that are intergovernmental. That means between two countries. They do not handle cases in individuals or in organizations or commercial organizations and, or, or shipping companies and stuff like that. So those will go to whatever relating to those relating to the law of the sea will go to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, uh, which was established in Hamburg uh, in Germany in 1982. Sadly, as you can see, Malta, which was the what you call as the prime mover of the Law of the Sea conference because of Arvid Pardo, uh, and they tried their best. They tried their best to get at least one of these bodies in Malta, uh, but they were singularly unsuccessful for various political machinations that that uh, countries like Jamaica or Germany, or of course the U.S. could uh, could uh, could. Uh, could wriggle around and, and get those bodies to themselves. And Malta ended up with uh, uh, nothing, actually. Uh, but they're still doing well with, uh, with the International Ocean Institute and the International Maritime Law Institute, among other things. The University of Malta, Malta also does a lot of work on uh, ocean governance. Uh, it lost trust fund was created. So again, um, any disputes, any financial disputes arising uh, out of uh, shipping uh, again, uh, uh, out of maritime activities, uh, then again, uh, the trust fund was created so that uh, a polluter pays mechanism can be uh, held, uh, can be, can function. And of course, the 60th instrument of ratification uh, brought it into force on the 16th of November, uh, 1994. So that's the date uh, when the law of the sea is considered to be in force, as it were. Uh, also, the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea was, although it was established immediately after the convention uh, it was signed, and, uh, the treaty was signed, the, uh, the actual building and uh, the, the creation of the premises for the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea uh, was only uh, in 1999-2000, around that time. And it's a, it's a fantastic place to, to visit. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the finest international uh, buildings, very modern building, keeping uh, an old building on uh, around which it was built, uh, also maintained very well. Uh, in fact, they have something called the International Foundation for the Law of the Sea in that old building, uh, where I've had the uh, opportunity to lecture at the International Foundation for the Law of the Sea, where they do a, uh, a summer course on ocean governance. Um, and then, of course... So so just sort of interrupt in between. Uh, we have thirty minutes uh, left. Okay, so I should be I should be okay. I'll, I'll I'll hopefully I've got a couple of slides to go and I should be all right. Thank you, Sneha. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so then the area is beyond national jurisdiction because I will be talking to you on Tuesday about the other maritime zones and then how we have in, increasingly shrunk the area beyond national jurisdiction. But still, it is it is still a significant chunk of the ocean. The area beyond national jurisdiction is a significant chunk. I made a mistake uh, yesterday uh, when I said it was 40% of the ocean. Actually, 40% of the area of the earth, actually. So it's even bigger than that. So I, that was my mistake. But anyway, high seas and international seabed authority. Hang on, I need to... Yeah, so high seas uh, and international seabed area together. So international seabed area, which is the seafloor, and the high seas above it. So the entire water column and the, the sea on top, the seabed, and the subsurface below that. Okay, all of that form what is known as the International Seabed Authority. Sorry, they, they form the area beyond national jurisdiction. The seabed authority is only concerned about the seabed, not about the water. So if, if you want to take the water into account, the seabed into account, and uh, that would be the area outside the national jurisdiction, and that's why it's called the ABNJ. 40% of the area of the earth, or 66% of the area of the ocean, or 95% of the ocean by volume, I also said that the biosphere was 99%. So only 4% is not there. 95% is in the you know, area beyond national jurisdiction. 95% of the ocean by volume is in the area beyond national jurisdiction. So it's very important from that point of view, from the point of view of protection and preservation of biological diversity. And not, not just biological diversity, it is hitherto unknown biological diversity because we don't know much about it. You know, so there's so much unknown there. There's so many species that we don't know about. There are so many species we don't know about how beneficial they could be to us. Yeah, from a from whole lot of uh, from from the point of view of food, from the point of view of agriculture. I mean, sorry, sorry, food uh, nourishment from the point of view of um, uh, uh, your pharma- pharmaceuticals, uh, industrial uses, and so on and so forth. You know, there there could be there could be organisms that could be eating plastic, for example. Pe- people are discovering those now slowly that they are they are they were they are uh, devouring plastics, and uh, you know they they can still survive and thrive uh, eating plastic. So there's a whole lot of those kind of uh, things happening, uh, and we should be very uh, very uh, grateful, in fact, to the International Law Commission and to the VBNJ or the High Seas Treaty that we have come this far. So, and so the ABNJ is the area beyond natural jurisdiction and the BBNJ is the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So BBNJ Treaty or the Treaty of the High Seas or the High Seas Treaty as it is called, is an important shift. The BBNJ Treaty represents an important shift of focus for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea still remains predominant organization or the body or the body of uh, law. But BBNJ Treaty represents an important shift in that the control and prevention of pollution and over-exploitation of living marine resources to direct management and conservation of biodiversity, including more importantly, see, up up till now, the law of the sea was looking at uh, animals, you know, protecting animals at, an, at at an animal level, you know, at a at an organism level. But this is looking at its genetic components for the first time. The BBNJ Treaty, <coughs> because I, I I told you about marine genetic resources. So BBNJ Treaty will will be looking at uh, not just protecting the the biodiversity at the level of an, of an organism, but at a level, at a genetic level. So this is where the importance of the BBNJ Treaty is. And uh, they are the ones who want, and I hope this happens, uh, to have 30% of the ocean declared as a protected area by 2030. I hope that's, that's, that, that becomes a reality.
So you have muted yourself. Can you unmute? Just now or a little while ago? Yeah, just, just now when you change okay. this. Right, okay. So the United Nations uh, Office of High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. So this is a mouthful. It's called UNOHRLLS. Okay. Now, this is not really relevant to our discussion because, but we are talking about global governance. So we cannot include these countries, uh, sorry, we cannot exclude these countries, um, which, are, which, which, which are going to be affected because of climate change, because of environment changes, because of resource exploitation, because of BBNJ Treaty, because of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and you know trade laws and all sorts of things. So, so although this is not really relevant or directly connected with the ocean governance thing, but because they are affected tremendously. So I thought I should mention these here. <coughs> so there are 45 what we call as least developed countries in the world, 45 least developed countries. And they represent the poorest and the most vulnerable segment of international community. So out of 195 or so countries, 45 are designated as the least developed or the poorest countries in the world. Okay. Then there are 32 what are known as landlocked developing countries. Least, there are actually 44 landlocked countries, but 32 of them are the poor countries. The other 12 countries are luckily rich countries like Switzerland or like Austria or like uh, Liechtenstein. So those are very rich countries, but they're also landlocked countries. There are two countries, in fact, that are double landlocked. That means they are surrounded by countries that are also surrounded by countries. Does that make sense? Because if, if, if for example, India has access to the sea, but Bhutan doesn't. Okay. So Bhutan is, would be called, or Nepal, would be called as a landlocked country. But there are countries that are double landlocked. So Liechtenstein is one, which is, of course, a very rich country. And, and Azerbaijan is the other one, which is double landlocked. So they, they're surrounded by countries that are surrounded by countries. And then there is C after that. Anyway, so there are 32 landlocked developing countries. So being a landlocked country for a developing country is, 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 is a problem because they might have a resource, but they don't have a mechanism to take it out or they don't have a mechanism to bring stuff in. So because I said C, the sea and the ships are the cheapest means of transporting goods and services. So if you don't have a coast, if you don't have ports and harbors, you know, you cannot get your goods out and you cannot get goods in. And that's where the problem is. So 34 landlocked developing countries, the poor landlocked developing countries, 44 are landlocked developing countries, face challenges due to their remoteness, lack of territorial access to the sea, and significant distance from world markets. Okay. And finally, the third category, which is the small island states. So small island states, there are 57 of them. Again, some, some of them are rich, you know, but we're talking about the poor ones. And there, there are two groupings. One is called the Association of Small Island States, and the other is called Small Island Developing States. So most of them come under one or the other category, many of which are again remote from the world markets and suffer from climate change and fragile natural environments. So a particular example would be Maldives or Nauru that I was mentioning yesterday. <clears throat> Maldives has an average height of something ridiculous like 1.5 meters, uh, which means that a, a large tsunami could completely obliterate the, the land. In fact, uh, as an aside, I can tell you that Maldives some years ago, I don't know how, where that application now is, had, had uh, approached the United Nations to give them a homeland in, uh, in, in Australia or in India and the third country, I forget, maybe it's Sri Lanka, I'm not sure, but they had, they had approached the United Nations to give them a homeland in case, in case this happens or in, in case this is imminent, then they would like a homeland somewhere and that homeland could be in Australia or in India, and I think the third country was Sri Lanka, but I'm, I, I stand to be corrected on that. But finally, uh, I think I'm on the last slide now. So hope, yeah, that's good. 
So, right. So, we're talking about governance. So, I end with what I call as the 10 tenets of governance. 10 principles of governance, 10 commandments, as it were, you know. Uh, and this is thanks to my good friend, Mike Elliott, who's a very renowned professor uh, in uh, ocean-related uh, work. Uh, not so much ocean governance, but he's, he's more of a marine biologist, but of course, he, he has wide knowledge and uh, wisdom. So he has created these 10 tenets on governance. And uh, well, basically, they're self-explanatory, but I can quickly go through uh, each one of them. Uh, in two minutes, as it were. Uh, environmentally sustainable, obviously, it has got to be. It's got to be economically viable. Money, as I said, money makes the world go round. Technologically feasible, you have to have the technology to do it, otherwise it's pointless. It's like imagining things and not being able to do it for reality. Socially desirable. If you want to do something for the people, make sure that they want it. If they don't want it, you know, however much you do it, it will still not be desirable by the people. They don't want it don't do it, or, or at least tell them how good it is for them and then do it. Legally permissible. If it is illegal, again, you know, you are on dodgy grounds. Administratively achievable. You know, you, you have to have, you know, uh, it has to be implemented. Implementation is mo most important. So administratively, uh, administratively achievable. Politically expedient. You know, you, A famous political philosopher used to say, politics is like a, like a le le leviathan. It's a, it's a huge animal. So uh, you touch, you tickle it uh, in its front end and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the rear end takes a long time to register it, you know. So, so that, is, uh, that is what the problem is. So politics is very slow. So politically expedient, it has to happen quickly because politicians, you know, want to delay things, you know, what they call the ABCD of politics, you know, avoid, bypass, confuse, divert, you know. So that happens all the time in politics, which which you have to avoid. So ethically defensible, it's got to be moral. It's got to be morally right for poor people, for the for the disabled people, for the women, you know. Women, and I, I, have, I have to mention this very quickly, that women, if you see, when I was talking about uh, corporate social responsibility or Indian social uh, individual social responsibility, role of civil society. If you see the definition of civil society, according to the UN, according to the uh, United Nations uh, Conference on Environment and Development in Rio, Agenda 21, the first two uh, listed are women and children. The reason is women are 50% of this world and children will inhabit that, inhabit that world in the future. Not me, I'll be dead, but it's the children who will be inhabiting that world in the future. So it's very important that we pay attention to these two interest groups, two, two very important interest groups, women and children. So ethically defensible, culturally inclusive. So you cannot go against the culture of a local place. It's very important. Culture is the most important thing for human being, for humanity. You know, taking away somebody's culture because you want to build a dam, you want to construct a motorway or highway or something, it is, it, it is just uh, indefensible. And then effectively communicate, communicable. You should be able to communicate what you are doing, why you're doing it, how good is it for you, how cost effective it is for you, how legal it is, how moral it is. All of these things you should be able to communicate well to the people for whom you are doing it. So those are the 10 tenets of governance. So I hope um, I, I have been able to convey some thoughts to you and we still have 15 minutes to go. So I'm very happy to, I'll be very happy to take uh, questions, comments, criticism, uh, et cetera, suggestions, whatever. I'll try and uh, stop sharing. And thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Then thank you, sir, for such an informative session. Uh, I'll request the participants, if you have any question, you all can unmute yourself and go ahead with the question. Maybe a discussion we can have on this.
anybody who would like to uh, comment on anything or have any queries can unmute yourself and go ahead or maybe raise your hand while people are thinking of questions uh, maybe if uh, because i'm not here for tomorrow's talk by captain agnihotri uh, and he wanted to say something yesterday uh, and perhaps he might have something to say today so if you want to say something sir i'll be very happy to take uh, you know you know have a quick conversation before somebody raises their hand Agnihotri, sir, are we audible to you? Maybe. Yes, uh, 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 of course, I'm there. Yes. Yeah. So very happy before while while we while people prepare for their questions. If you have any thoughts or any, because you, you did say you have a you had something to say yesterday and we didn't have time. Well, yesterday was uh, I lost the thread. Uh, it was uh, huh, it was on the hydrothermal vents. Yes. Yes. And, we did. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. There are some uh, very high technologies that uh, are uh, being, uh, mm. being uh, I would say, uh, considered, particularly yes. in China and US. Mm. With regard to uh, the UUVs, unmanned mm. underwater vehicles, Yes. the main problem in prolonged uh, operation of underwater vehicles uh, is that uh, the battery life is short. Yes. So uh, there is a idea that hydrothermal uh, vents are uh, good sources of uh, generating electricity if you can come out with some kind of a technology uh -huh, uh -huh. then these under under uh, water unmanned vehicles yes. can charge themselves right. from the hydrothermal vents itself uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, then uh, they will be uh, theoretically uh, hmm. operating without any time limit yes yes and and uh, tell me, Captain Ag Agniotri, is, is Germany still at the forefront of the hydrothermal vents? Because it was at one time. I believe so must be facing some internet issues. Mm. He is mm. there online, but... Yeah. Not to worry. Not to worry. Are there any any questions anybody has or any comments or thoughts that you want to offer? Uh, sir, I do have a question. Can I ask? Yes, please. Don't yeah. ask. Don't ask if you have, if you can ask a question. Please do ask. <laughs> thank you. Sir, thank you so much for that lecture. It was uh, quite insightful to hear. Uh, so, wherein you mentioned this point, I had a bit of doubt, and also uh, I have to ask this. Uh, you made this point where you suggest that poverty pollutes and absolute poverty pollutes absolutely. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I'm a political scientist by training. So I believe that this kind of uh, a sort of generalization uh, comes from, is based around this modernization theory, wherein we believe that we mm. have to attain a certain, or we have to follow a certain path of development that has mm. already been set uh, before us. And then only after attaining that kind of uh, attaining all those resources and attaining that kind of development, we can then uh, trickle down the pollution levels and all. So do we have that space wherein all these third world countries and et cetera, they take on this path and then we reach a point where uh, things uh, kind of get in their places. So on the other end, why don't we talk about alternatives wherein we don't see uh, poverty as being imposed, but rather than some sort of idea that Gandhi uh, has uh, put that we should believe in voluntary poverty, wherein we use resources, but in a judicious sense, and we kind of do not uh, single-mindedly focus on the path of development that has been uh, provided by the Western Europe. So why don't we look at, at these alternatives wherein the poverty is not a kind of imposed, but a choice of uh, a, a sort of a judicious choice of uh, using resources? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Let me let me start with the last point you made about Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Mahatma Gandhi had interesting things to say about these things, you know. So one of the first things that he said is that there is enough for the uh, for the needs of mankind, but not enough for the greed of mankind. OK, so there's enough, enough in the world for the need of everybody, but not enough in the world for the greed of anybody. 
that was his uh, quote you know so taking on from that he uh, you know he he would he would he would say that there, there was there was I, I don't know whether you saw the movie gandhi you know so there was a, there was this um, american uh, journalist uh, paul, uh, paul paul what no what, what fisher he was called some fisher paul fisher or something his name was he wrote the book actually after that but anyway so he was he asked you know in a tongue in cheek way to mahatma gandhi in manchester when mahatma gandhi went to manchester and he asked him mr gandhi what do you think of western civilization yeah and mahatma gandhi said that would be a splendid idea you know so that kind of gives you a flavor of what mahatma gandhi's vision was about what mahatma gandhi thought about western civilization because we don't want to repeat the wrongs that the western civilization has done if that is the point you are getting to i think you know so that we have to avoid the mistakes that they have made and how can we avoid those mistakes because we have something called high technology okay so we don't need always to have the high technology for doing our things then there's something called low technology that means we say oh it, these, you know these are all poor people you know they they don't need the high technology this is the rubbish technology you know bullock cart and all that will do fine for them you know you don't they don't they don't need the uh, you know cars and trucks and stuff like that so that can be one way of looking at things so high technology and no low technology but there can be something called intermediate technology yeah and that's that's where the solutions are the solutions are with intermediate technology but more importantly not even just intermediate technology it is the appropriate technology you know technology that is appropriate for the for the for the society for the for the level of development that they have for the level of education that they have for the level of economic uh you know uh, resources that they have and so on so that that's what you would call as appropriate technology so there was um, there was a very famous man called e e schumacher uh, he was um, i think you're the german but he he lived in in the uk for the, for most of his life and created something for the uh, called the intermediate technology development center itdg itdc Inter intermediate technology development center and he had a famous book which became you know like a like a you know like rachel carson's silent, silent spring and it it was called uh, small is beautiful you know the book was called small is beautiful and the subtitle was as if people mattered i think that's what you are coming coming from yeah as if people mattered so small is beautiful as if people mattered that was the subtitle of the book and he he was talking about this whole idea of intermediate technology you know so there there's a man called richard bailis i think his name is b a y l i w s in the, in the uk and he is credited with inventing a lot of stuff a simple thing like a um, it called winding radio so you know you need i mean radio is a, is a source of information for for villagers for for weather forecast for whatever you know so but they do they need a battery for it where do they get the battery for so this guy had winding radio so what you do is you wind the radio at night before you go to sleep next morning when you get up you have a battery charge and you can listen to the radio for the rest of the day so this some 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 simple things like that and going back to then your first point about you know the the whole idea of uh, like i i i i try to explain about poverty pollutes and absolute poverty uh, pollutes absolutely the the idea is not to put down the poor people the idea is to say that you know poor people cannot afford to create the levels of pollution that we have because poor people don't have the access to the resources that can counter the ill effects of the pollution you know like i gave the examples of you know rich people having air condition houses and cars and you know air purifiers and you know pollen pollen extractors and stuff like that yeah so i think that was my 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 point uh i i don't know whether that is uh, sort of uh, given any satisfactory re reply to your questions or comments uh, sir yes it did uh, actually the point that you made about the intermediate technology uh, this is the part of this is the kind of research that we do and mm. we have been also uh, kind of focusing on the alternative solutions that are energy efficient cost efficient and which is not given on the the set pathways but to look at the different alternatives just to give an example there is this uh, gujarat based uh, 
organization called Mitty Cool, mm-hmm. which kind of makes a refrigerator which do not requires energy or electricity. Absolutely. So that's the kind of innovation. I recently went to uh, Karoli district in Rajasthan, mm-hmm. wherein these people are using siphon pipes to draw water from the Johards without using mm-hmm. electricity. So these are the kind of alternatives that. I mean, I've been focusing on very various case studies in Global South. So I've been g- getting various instances where they have been using their, uh, you know, what what we say as community knowledge to, mm-hmm. you know, regulate uh, and to also counter the big problems of climate issues. So this is so this is the kind of uh, essence that I've been drawing from those work that we do not actually require resources or let's say big capital to do, you know, counter these big issues. Smaller kind of arrangements based on community knowledge can help us reach that point, uh, kind of uh, goal that we uh, envisage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you talked about Mitty Cool. And uh, when we were, when I was young, you know, I came from a very modest background, very, very modest family. We, we didn't have a fridge until uh, I think uh, the early 90s in my house, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I think 1990 something, you know, in my, in my parents' house, we didn't have a fridge until that point in time. So anyway, so when I was little, we, that Mitty Cool was, I mean, I don't know what Mitty Cool now is exactly, but all we did was we had a, we had a more like a, uh, you know, like a cylindrical shaped uh, Mittika, you know, uh, you know, uh, water storage thing. But instead of storing water in it, you put only a little bit of water and covered it with Haitian cloth, wet Haitian cloth, and put your food during the summer. You cooked food or your vegetables or whatever. You put them in that, and they lasted much longer. You know, and without, of course, using any electricity. So what that is a very good example of how we can use our um, uh, what do you what do you call traditional knowledge systems to some extent, but more importantly, things like I mean, what we talk about water harvesting, etc. These techniques have been used in India for a long time. A building, also building, for example, you know, when we make houses or buildings and structures, you know, why must we follow the Western pattern of concrete and glass and steel buildings, you know. Why can't we build buildings out of mud and uh, thatch and that kind of stuff, you know, because they will be much more environmentally friendly and also more suitable for our kind of thing. Because what has happened now, if you see many of these mega structures, mega buildings that that are there, they're all uh, glass enclosed and you cannot open the glass, so you have to have air conditioning, you know, because you, you can't even get normal ventilation in those because most of the glasses are permanently closed in these tall buildings. So you can't even, uh, you know, you have to have essentially, it is essential to have air conditioning for these large buildings. And that is basically counterproductive because all you're doing is heating the atmosphere more. And then again, you're trying to cool the atmosphere by air conditioning. So yes, I mean, I completely take your point, but these are the things we have to uh, progress, you know, proactively uh, think about and work on, and I'm. I congratulate you and your team of people who you work with uh, for for doing what you're doing, and you know all the uh, what they call all the more elbow grease to you. You know. Thank Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Welcome. Very welcome. Thank you, Puneet, for the question. Um, is there anyone else who wants to go ahead with the question? Yeah, Dr. Shastri, Captain Agni Yes, sir. Yeah, I lost uh, connectivity. Mm. The hydrothermal vents, uh, as a deep sea uh, mining uh, scientist, mm. I want to know are these Chinese and Americans talking only science fiction when they say they can charge uh, their batteries of underwater vehicles uh, from the heat uh, emanated by the hydrothermal vents? Because my understanding of hydrothermal vents from your talk was mm. they are rich in minerals and they are yes. being harvested only for minerals yes. like cobalt yeah. and uh, some other minerals uh, yeah. and some traces of Co- gold cobalt, and silver. copper, zinc, cobalt, copper, zinc, and uh, well, zinc, zinc, uh, zinc, copper, cobalt, and uh, traces of uh, silver and gold. Can the heat uh, within these hydrothermal vents? be converted to some kind of electricity or is it in the realm of the science fiction? I am not sure because I, I, I don't know about it really, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but so uh, but we, we'll have to search I, for these hydrothermal vents. Yeah. 
correct but I, I know for a fact that so name that, is hydro and thermal exactly so there's thermal there so there's, there's heat heat there obviously immense amounts of heat is there so it might be it might well be true but i i, I don't know personally but having said that um uh, as you probably know that uh, uh, india china uh, i think it was france and it was i think if i'm not mistaken japan were the four pioneer investors as far as ocean mining is concerned particularly of course related to manganese nodules but uh, i think we still maintain that position uh, in the international uh, arena and um, of course there is now many more players because uh, a lot of countries have uh, joined up with um, uh, multinational corporations uh, like i was telling you uh, yesterday uh, nauru has uh, joined up with some companies uh, uh, in the west and so on uh, and uh, there, there is every possibility that ocean mining will happen i'm not sure whether it will happen first in hydrothermal vents or first it will happen in manganese nodules but it looks like um, i mean if i live long enough i i might hear that ocean mining is actually happening somewhere but uh, i'll just keep my fingers crossed but because it has not happened for 42 years uh, okay maybe we i am looking at uh, too deeply into china and uh, technology so possibly mm -hmm. uh, if i get something more uh, i will put it out uh, for common knowledge of all of us yeah and in, in fact you are going to you are going to taiwan now uh, in in the next few months and uh, you might because taiwan is of obviously uh, as advanced as any other country in the world so you might uh, get some tips from yes, there i, I will uh, look, look at uh, try and explore uh, as to as to it is a science fiction uh, just for propaganda or actually yes. it is feasible in some way i'll do that thank you yeah very kind thank you Anybody would like to go with the question? If not, sir, I believe we can wind up. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. I'm off tomorrow, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll have a wonderful session with uh, with Captain Agnihotri tomorrow, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday after the holy holiday. Yes, sir. See you on Tuesday. Uh, participants, tomorrow we have a session by uh, Captain K K Agnihotri, sir, on threats to the national security. Arising in the sea, uh, so the link for tomorrow's session will be uh, sent to you all in the morning. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sneha. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye.